Okay, so we're we're on. Today is Tuesday, November 8th. This is the meeting of the Disability Access Advisory Committee beginning at around 11.30 p.m. 11.36 to be precise. And um, uh, do we have any, well, roll call, I guess. I'm Myra Ross. We have, want to state your names if you're here. Pat DeAngelis, liaison. Marty <laughs> Sorry. Okay, Marty Smith. <laughs> and Elise Link. We have so we have currently three of our five members. We know that one of them has let us know that she's ill. Um, and we are waiting for the Dr. Poll. Nolan Young has arrived. Aha, uh -huh. okay. And welcome to Dr. Nolan Young. Do uh do we have any public here that because this is a public um uh, one second time no we don't no. okay all right then we can move right to announcements i will make one very quick one i went to the district four meeting um uh tracy zafian from the transportation advisory committee was there and chad fuller from the council on aging was there and the three of us have had some back and forth communications uh, about perhaps getting together and figuring out what the three committees have in common. Preliminarily, we figured out we probably have uh, street lighting, sidewalks, passable roads, uh, accessibility of um, meetings, in common and we were possibly going to get together to talk about some more so it's sort of cool that there's a little bit of connection between some town boards that are in many ways working for the same thing with the same populations um so that would that's good anybody else have any announcements hearing none we can move on to our guest today, who is Dr. Pamela Nolan Young. Do you use both of your last names? I do use both of my last names, and I want to uh, thank Councillor DeAngelis for the PhD, but it's a JD, so you don't have oh. to use a doctor. No. <laughs> okay, so we just say I stand attorney. corrected. We just say attorney Pamela, oh, or, or just Pamela is perfectly fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, so this is the Disability Access Advisory Committee, and we're all about disability access, um, and we like to be advisory. So um, I think we're a fun group, but we're a small group today. We're missing one of our members who's Saren Darren, and I don't know where she is. Um, she's one that has not let us know where she is, um, and Tori Dixon is ill um and so she's not able to be here so there's only three of us unfortunately um and we're supposed to be seven mm. so i guess the first thing i'll throw out before we even ask you to talk is we want you to help us and patricia pat <laughs> we want you to both help us get two more members because we've been down one for 15 months and we've been down two for three months now and so the 15 months one is starting to get old. Um, and I, I hope you can both help us get more members. All right, so um, we invited you here because when we heard that there was going to be a director of diver di diversity, equity and inclusion, we thought this is very cool because we think we fit under your umbrella. and. We hope you think we do. And we would like to know, um, you know, how you envision your position, maybe as it has anything to do with disability access. 
Well, I am really happy to be here, and I definitely see this as something that relates to the work that we're going to be doing. Um, I was given a list of questions. Would you like me to go through the list of questions, or would you like me to just start with an introduction about who I am and what my background is as it relates to disability access? I guess I'd like to hear the general statement first. I don't know about the sure. Questions. So um, I won't go into the a lot into my uh, background, but I think it will be important for you all to know that I have worked um, with disability coordinators and with the ADA before in, I believe, uh, three positions. So at one point in my career, I um, was the 504 coordinator for North Shore <clears throat> Community College and worked with a disability director there, um, Susan Graham. And then as the DEI um, director role at Smith College, uh, worked with a uh, Laura Roucher, who um, you may know um, is uh, a national advocate for disability rights. And the Office of Disability Services at Smith College actually reported to me um, in my role at Smith. And then thirdly, in my role at, um, at the University of Notre Dame, worked very closely with the disabilities uh, director there as well. So this is an area that I am have some familiarity with and have, um, have really worked with students, faculty, and staff um, to make sure that they got accommodations to work with. Um, at Smith, we did a comprehensive review of not only the buildings, um, but also of the curriculum and around accessibility with Laura and a, a, a few other members of the five college area. So I don't come without some knowledge, although I would not label myself as an as an expert um, in the field. And certainly I would agree that it is part of the broad charge of the DEI department. Wow, you have a <laughs> lot of experience. That's great. Um, does anybody want to make any comments before um, before Pamela gets to our questions? Just Comments welcome. questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hmm. No, that's great. You've been at a lot of different places too. And you've seen <laughs> how a lot of different... No, but you, you have information about how a lot of different places do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, or don't do it, whatever. Um, right. So, uh, oh, this is great. Okay. So do you want to answer the questions and then we can have a general Sure. Discussion? Sure. Yeah. So the first question was concerning the Lake George a uh, trip that's coming up and what, whether um, transportation uh, should be required um, to be ADA accessible. And I actually, as as any good lawyer, would have a question before I can answer <laughs> your question, <laughs> which is um, what role does this body have in sponsoring or the town in sponsoring the trip? Is it is it a, a trip that's co-sponsored by a town entity and an outside entity or completely sponsored by the town? Oh yeah. So I did um, if I may, hi Pamela, this is Maureen mm -hmm. Pollock um, mm -hmm. from the planning department. Um, so I um, just to give some background information. So uh, the senior services director, Haley Bolton attended the last meeting. Um, I can't remember the particulars of why she, she was in attendance. Oh, because of the bus, they're getting a, um, they're getting a new bus uh, for senior services. Um, and uh, we asked her to come and talk about it. Um, and it's that bus is gonna be ADA or van rather, is gonna be ADA accessible. Um, and that will be operational, hopefully starting in January. Um, she then um, mentioned um, to help promote a, um, a, a trip to Lake George, which is being organized and um, by um, the Friends of the Senior Center, which is a um, nonprofit. Um, and so there was a question. And so a question got brought up was, is the bus being provided 
that's going to Lake George that's transporting seniors to Lake George and back is that ADA accessible? And Haley had indicated that uh, unfortunately the 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 van uh, company um, didn't have a accessible van um, in their fleet. And so there was sort of this question of like, oh, well, that's too bad, you know, that that the van, sh the bus that goes to Lake George for this event should be um, ADA accessible to be uh, inclusive. And then there were questions of whether that was legal or illegal. So I did reach out to um, our town attorney through KP Law. And it is included in, uh, I included uh, my correspondence with KP Law in in, um, in my last email to everyone. So you should have that. Um, and um, so I provided the facts of the this particular situation, which is, so it's, again, it's a nonprofit that's organizing this event. Um, it's a, uh, and so the town is not organizing <coughs> the event. Um, so the town is not, um, subject of providing a accessible bus. Uh, KP Law uh, did say that, you know, um, it, the nonprofit and the bus company um, probably should provide a bus that is ADA accessible, um, but at the very minimum that they should um, have a, um, if if a request upon a, a, an attendee, it, um, comes about and and someone needs to have an accommodation provided such as they would like to attend they need a, they have a wheelchair how how would they get in that van um the the friends of uh the Amherst senior center and the bus company should provide a reasonable accommodation for that um so those two entities would would be responsible for that um so I think the event itself has already taken place. It was in October. Um, moving forward, uh, I then uh, forwarded my correspondence with the Senior Service Department. And um, moving forward, they will have a town-owned accessible van. Um, so if if either the town themselves or the Friends of the Senior Services um, plan a trip, um, they could use the town of Amherst accessible uh, van in, in the future if if, if this um, if if they are, are or, organizing future events. But um, one of the members from the DAAC said uh, wonderfully, you know, there's the law, and you know, so you know, all these entities are responsible to follow the law, and, and that gets you so far. But uh, if you dig a little deeper, um, are we being inclusive of you know, if um, do we do we want to make sure that the should that van from the get go should have that been ADA accessible? Should the friends of the senior center actually reached out to a different bus company that provided an ADA accessible van, or um, or not? And if there isn't a reasonable accommodation, is that one person driving being driven by themselves, or are they among their peers? Um, and so there was this question of what is what is what is the value and what what does inclusivity mean? Um, so that was a touching point that that the DAAC um, discussed last time, and they would love to hear your your comments on that. Okay, so I, I uh, hopefully I won't be in disagreement with KP Law, but I think uh, if the event is a town sponsored event, then there is a ADA mandate. So we would be required as a town to have. Yeah, yeah. Assess, it's not assess, a town. Yeah. It's not a town sponsored. Event. Yeah, I know. I Yeah, I, I understand that the past one wasn't. But just in answer to the question, mm -hmm. uh, if it's town sponsored, then then we um, have to have. Um, we have to provide accessibility. Um, and I think that the point is well taken that if um, even though the event and this past event was not sponsored by. Uh, the town, uh, the better practice would be for the friends of this board or the friends of the senior center to seek out um, a bus company that can provide uh, accessible transportation. I mean, that that's always the goal, right? To, to have the event um, 
uh, be as accessible and inclusive um, uh, to everyone. And I think if there were a case that where that was not a possibility, then there would have to be further conversation about what a reasonable accommodation would look like. And I'm sure you all know it looks different for every different question that's raised. So and it could be X in this instance and then Y in another one. So, um, but that would be my thinking that the town has an obligation. And um, when uh, the town is working with friends of the town that they would want to encourage that friend group to also um, provide accessible uh, transportation. And then the third step would be if that's not at all possible, um, then to have a discussion about what a reasonable accommodation would be. Yeah. So. So that would that would be my take on that. The um, and and I you know I really I'm going to answer these questions, but please feel free to like interrupt me and ask uh, ask questions or ask for more details. Like I um, would love for this to be more of a conversation rather than just Q and A from this yeah. uh, from this sheet. So the second question was, uh, does the DEI director know and understand ADA regulations? And so I um, I would answer yes to that for the reasons that I articulated before that I've worked in three different positions where I've had to um, review. Uh, ADA regulations, and I did not add, but I will, well, you know that I'm an attorney, so I'm, I am licensed to practice in Massachusetts and have been since 1988, so uh, for quite a while, uh, and most of my legal practice, all of it was really public sector for the most part with one short stint for a small law firm in Northampton, but most of it has been around um, uh, labor and employment law. I also worked at, uh, as a consultant for MCAD for a short while. So I pretty I feel pretty comfortable with Massachusetts laws in this area and also with the federal federal laws. And you were a 504 coordinator too. Yes, right, exactly. <laughs> right. So um, the third one is, uh, you know, am I an advocate for disability rights? And I, I think, you know, I mentioned earlier that I worked with Laura Roucher, um, who's at Smith College. And I, if I wasn't an advocate for disability rights before I, 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 I worked with Laura, I was certainly one after what, but I would say that I've always been an, an advocate for disability rights. And I, I learned a lot from both Laura um, and from um, Susan Graham, who was the DEA, um, the Disability Director at North Shore Community College. Um, and I was able to put a lot of what I <coughs> learned in practice um, for the benefit of the faculty, staff, and students that we worked with. So obviously, you know, um, disability directors are generally the experts and looking at accommodations for students. Um, but a lot of the information that we learned in that process, we use for accommodations for faculty and staff. Um, and, you know, uh, an example would be that one of the individuals who worked in the departments um, that was, it wasn't facilities, but something that wasn't like an office setting uh, at North Shore Community College had the responsibility of uh, entering in data into a new system that the department used. And the individual just had a lot of difficulty like using the computer and understanding like the, as his manager described, the person knew the job 100% one of the best employees, but you know, working with the computer was not, was not um, easy for this individual. And so we, uh, decided to uh, provide an accommodation by using um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, which allowed the person to really, you know, convey the information that was in his head in a way that would work with the system. So I think the answer to that uh, is also a yes. Um, uh, I, you know, the fourth thing down is that, you, you know, you don't want disabilities to be an afterthought. And so I'm going to ask you to make sure that you hold me accountable um, and make sure that I'm always keeping all of the many, many things on my plate, <laughs> um, giving them equal time. And so um, that's not always an easy task because there are so many things that 
this department is responsible for. And I'll just say, in addition to working with all the town departments and managers, we're also tasked with working with three different boards. So the Human Rights Commission, the African Heritage Reparations Assembly, and the um, Community Safety and Social Justice Commission. Um, and when I say we, I, I um, included in the work with me is Jen Moyston that many of you may know. Jen is the Assistant Director in the DEI uh, department and we are really trying to work as partners because she has the in-depth knowledge of Amherst and has been a lifelong Amherst resident. And um, and so I, I can't, can't really envision myself doing the job well without um, her knowledge and expertise about the town. And, and so we are really working as a partnership. Um, I will say that one of the things that we are, that's next in line for us to to really roll out is a self-assessment tool for each of the departments. Um, I, I'm just recently completed that and I'm waiting for um, the town manager to, re to review and approve it so that we can roll it out. But included in that assessment, in addition to sort of asking about racial and gender demographics, we are also um, asking um, questions that are related to uh, the ADA and accessibility. This first pass at the assessment tool is um, is really like a broad brush. So I did not want it to be overwhelming. So um, we're only asking 15 questions and they it covers a wide you know range of things that we have to ask, but there is a, a question about accessibility. And one of the things that we've targeted for the future is that, and um, I'm sure you're aware of this, under the federal law where we have targets for hiring for employment practices um, for individuals who identify as having a, a disability. Um, we don't currently, meaning the town doesn't currently gather that information, but going forward, that's something that we will try to do a better job of, of gathering that information and, and having that available. So to, to see if we are making strides towards um, towards those targets. So there are, this is the one exception in the federal law, what people would say as quotas, right? Is that the, the federal government encourages employers to have targets for veterans and for individuals who identify as having a disability. And I'm sure you all know that the definition of having a disability is, is quite broad. So it's likely we are, we're, you know, have reached our, our target quite easily. But in order to know that you have to really be gathering the information and asking the right questions. So that's on the to-do list of things. I'm sorry, uh, just who the questionnaire is targeted so the, que the questionnaire, this initial questionnaire is going to go out to department managers. We're trying ah, to get a snapshot okay. of who's in each department, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And Great. may I ask, um, does the employee need to reveal their their uh, name and identity? No. So the, this question questionnaire, is, the demographic information is being provided through um, HR through human resources. And it's where basically, as I said, broad brush. So it's just numbers. There's no uh, individual uh, names provided for managers. And as you, you know, as you all probably know as well, you know, people have a right to disclose or not disclose. So, you know, some may disclose, some may not disclose. We don't currently have any um, information whatsoever on on those two categories. So in the future, I think once the new HR director is um, on board, I would love to partner with her to ask her to do a general broad survey. Um, um, and in my, I guess, yeah, actually in all of my prior em employers have um, sent out broad employee surveys asking people to reveal um, on a va variety of different categories. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't, but at least it gives you a baseline of information. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's an interesting question about whether to disclose or not. You never know whether to mm -hmm. disclose or not. Or at what goal? time, at what point in- right. uh, What's the goal of the survey? 
Okay, but well, the goal of the survey is to um, establish a benchmark for where the town is on a number of different DEI sort of um, parameters. So one of the things that we'd wanna do is take a look at gender equity, to look at racial equity. And as I said, the federal government has these two categories where they have, um, they have um, sort of goals for people to aspire to for veterans and for individuals with disabilities. So while this survey won't ask specifically for those two categories because we don't have the data, um, the overall goal is to start, a start is to establish some benchmarking for the departments around DEI initiatives. So we'll we'll get confirmation of the data that we currently have on race and on gender. And then in the future, we'll add um, these other categories. And then we're also going to ask departments to talk, to look about, to think about their policies, the sort of programs they offer. So, you know, it's 15 questions, um, you know, uh, and they're, they're very broad. They're, Uh-oh. Yep. Oh, you're there. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh, okay. You cut out in the middle of the word. <laughs> okay. So I wasn't I wasn't sure whether you disappeared or not. All okay. Right. All, All right. right. It, any questions or did, did that satisfy the the that response was sufficient for you? Yeah. Okay, great. Um that is Sarah. And she came late. Yes. Hi. Because, now we because have four I was, people. I was a or Zoom, you know, I mean, I mean, I connected to Zoom and it says uh, she, uh, the leader is in another meeting. So I just kept on waiting and then I <laughs> shoot that email and Maureen kindly before. answered, gave me another connection. So, uh, oh. Yeah. oh, and I yeah. just wanted to let everyone know that uh, uh, Tracy Zafian is, is here oh, as a okay. member of the, of the public. Public, okay. All right. Okay. Uh, so the, the fifth uh, um, uh, question or statement is, uh, the DEI office could provide real educational component for the town regarding disability rights, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion. And that is certainly on one of the tasks that Jennifer and I will take on. So, and I think we'll, uh, we will do that through professional development, um, probably first for departments. Um, but we have also said that we would be willing to do our workshops for members of the community, other um, groups in town. So if there's an opportunity to have us speak on a specific topic, we would welcome that opportunity to do to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have anything to say right there to that? Because I can think of some things. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I keep hearing at the last meeting, Elise said the most important thing, I think, to me, um, which is we don't want to be an afterthought. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that if some of those trainings could include the notion of pre-planning and thinking a little bit about what if you have people who don't fit in because, or don't feel like they fit in, or don't feel welcome because, or can't get in, or can't participate if they do, or can't get there. Um, that Those are all important yep. things. Getting there, getting in, and being a part of something are really three different things. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of all need to be there. And I don't know if anybody wants to throw in more about that than what I thought, but it's always, well, let's plan this. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, we didn't do that. Well, that's too bad. Probably won't have any impact on anybody. Oh, well. Um, and I think what came up at the last meeting for me was I sort of asked if the senior center programs, which sound actually quite good, mm -hmm. um, were going to be, it said they were all, you had to be present for all of them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that in the era of Zoom, the one good thing, and maybe there are more good things, but one good thing that came out of the pandemic is this use of Zoom and platforms that, do na that, that make it much easier for more people to participate yeah. if they wanna be there and it's safe to be there, that's great, and they can get there. But if they don't 
have a way to get there or they don't have time to get there or they don't want to be there and they still want to be able to participate, it would be great if there were options. And those senior uh, center programs did not seem to be headed in the inclusivity direction. No. Um, that was not an interest that was voiced. Um, yeah, there. I also remember a comment made uh, in when we were discussing this, that oh, PVTA can be used, and then we have uh, things you can talk to people when you have there and we have puzzles, puzzles and games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. and you know, people uh, they think that people like us have lots of the whole day to spare just for an hour long meeting wait for the band to pick us early an hour at least and wait another additional hour for them to pick us yep. back to take home you know so it's i did not see the respect that is all to people with disabilities so that was really very disappointing for so uh, here yes. i think from the director of senior services right so i i am sorry that you had that experience and um certainly um haley would be one of the directors that we will be having conversations with i don't want to make excuses um uh, and i'm glad that you're you've brought that to me to my attention so i will make sure that um that i'm aware of that and i have that conversation and i i will say that Oftentimes, and I'm sure you have experienced this, people um, assume that they have created a venue that is accessible in some way, and then um, they find out that it has it's not that there's some piece that's missing. I, I have, you know, in especially working on college campuses, um, we've had people schedule events in certain rooms and it's listed as accessible and then we found out oh well yeah that room has a lift but no one knows how to operate it or where the key is right so it's not accessible so that will certainly be a part of the conversations that we have um, with all of our with all of our managers about programming and um, so thank you for bringing that to my attention and I will make sure that I convey your concerns um, and that they will be included obviously as part of the training and workshops that we that we will do. Yeah. Another, another thing that has always uh, bothered me in my years of uh, trying to be active in the community is the attitude is very important. Mm -hmm. Atti attitude of people and especially with the managers. Mm -hmm. So uh, that should be really stressed. I always remember something that happened to me. Um, I was attending a meeting in the medical school of UMass in Worcester. I was driven there and, and then I was on my own and I was on the elevator going to the upper level where the meeting was going to be held. And everybody in the elevator, we're asking each other, is she getting off here? Is she getting off here? They couldn't address to me because they thought I wouldn't understand. And I said, no, she's not. <laughs> <laughs> so that I remember. Right. So it is oh, I'm yeah. very sensitive to the attitudes when I go to a hospital with somebody with a PCA with me and they say, does she need help or does she, they don't address, they're afraid to address people with disabilities. This is true. So maybe, yeah. maybe we should stress that when you talk with the managers, that the attitude is very important. They have to get in their minds that we are no different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than them. We just use another device for our mobility. Right. Yeah, or, I, you know, or a service dog or, you know, or a cane. And so when I was an elected town meeting member, which I was for many years, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't have the town council government before three years ago, four years ago. Um, so there was a, a, there was a select board and a town meeting that was sort of like a legislative body. And I was part of that. And I was even a member of the school committee 
for three terms. And when I would walk into the town meeting from the outside and there were people out there leafleting, if I walked in with anybody, they would give the leaflet to the other person, <sighs> ask me if I wanted one. They would talk to the other person, just like Saren said, yeah. yep. um, sometimes is, do you need, um, you know, does she need, yeah. um, you know, there is, there is, there is a lot of that. In fact, I recently read a book written by a blind person about how to access medical care as a blind person. And one of the things she says is don't take a, a personal care attendant into the mm. uh, provider's office because you want to make sure they're going to talk to you. Mm. Um, yeah. And, you yeah. know, silly little things like that. There is an there's an invisibility that we have, yes. um, and maybe it's discomfort. I don't know what it is, but we it's the afterthought thing again. You know, we're invisible. They plan events, and then oh yeah, well you can come and play with the puzzles. Well, sure you can get here, and you know, well bring have your friends bring out bring you, and um, yeah. there are just just things like that that make you feel second class uh, mm -hmm. like a second class citizen yeah and yeah. you know if they pile on top of each other and if you don't have um the same level of strength that Saren has and maybe that i have and maybe that elise has um you you can be put off and and just check out right yeah yeah, yeah. um elise um, has raised her hand oh um, go ahead yeah, um, I echo a lot of what um, um, Myra said, because I've had that done since I was a kid and even as an adult. And they, they think, you you know, if you're disabled or for me, because I'm legally blind, they think I'm deaf and dumb, too, you know? Yeah. Um, and the other thing I was thinking, I was wondering if you're going to have these workshops, are you going to have anybody with a disability come and speak? at any of them to do a little educating. I would welcome that. So are you volunteering? Yeah, <laughs> I am volunteering because, you know, I, there's just a lot. And the thing is, I can't expect somebody to know right away, oh, you know, she's got a guide dog, she's, you know, blind or whatever, and she needs to, I often have to say, can you, like today I, at the polls, I said, um, I'm legal, you know, I'm vision sight impaired or I'm vis legally blind or whatever. Could you give me a direction? Meaning, you know, right, left, don't mm -hmm. just go, oh, it's over that way. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be addressed, you know, just certain things besides the speaking for somebody else, you know, speaking to somebody else. Yeah, I'm volunteering. I would, I would come and talk if, if that were welcome and if that were needed. Yeah, well, it's definitely welcomed, and I'm sure it's probably also definitely needed as well. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I think I, enough people, you know, people really need to hear from us who are disabled, you know, because they don't know what we need a lot of times. And for them to hear it from us might be helpful. Right. Well, I think personal narratives are really helpful and in any okay. situation when you're trying to have people have an understanding of some sort of difference. And yeah. so I would definitely welcome that. Thank you for volunteering. All right, thank you. For, yeah. So um, so oh. that, was, that sure. was actually sort of cool. question number six. Oh, okay. And so the, the, um, the last question was um, um, asking me about my roles and responsibilities. And what am I going to focus on? Which I addressed a little bit, but I can go into a little bit more detail. So I really um, see the department as having three large containers that we're focusing on. Um, the first one is internal, right? Working with all of the department managers and staff and thinking about how the town operations work whether they're inclusive, whether they're equitable, whether there's accessibility, and there's a lot 
of work to be done in that area looking internally, you know, so translation services um, has recently been added to one of the responsibilities of this department as an example. So there's, there's a lot of, of work to be done with the internal focus. Uh, the external fo focus is, um, you know, the community engagement piece, which is not only community members in Amherst, but also the businesses, so the Chamber of Commerce, the BID, the colleges and universities. Um, Jen and I have met with our counterpart at Hampshire College and we'll be meeting with our counterpart at Amherst College tomorrow. Um, and then other organizations in town, um, the League of Women Voters has asked us to um, to meet with them. Um, the Amherst Women's, I think it's Women's Club, has asked um, to to meet. So that sort of community engagement piece is also a big part of our job. And the third piece is the one that is, um, in my eyes, the most challenging and the most important. And, uh, and I am thinking about this every day, examining everything I do, and that is the racial healing and reconciliation. And I think we would just say reconciliation for and healing for everyone. That is the, that's really what drew me to this job because there are not many communities who have decided that they want to take on that task of trying to be a more equitable and inclusive community, but it is also the, mo the most difficult aspect of the job and has been very challenging um, over the last few <laughs> months. So, um, but that's, that's, you know, what I signed up for and what really excites me about the position um, is the, is that aspect of the work and so, just trying to work with Jen to create opportunities for that healing and reconciliation to happen. Um, and, and thinking about different ways in which we can bring folks together around a number of different issues. Um, so so that's, that's the, the work in a nutshell. I would say it's a really big nut. <laughs> and a hard one to crack, that's uh, for sure. Very, <laughs> definitely. Wow. This is great. We're very lucky to have you. This is, oh. this is, no, this is great. I hope you don't get scared away. Well, if you haven't by now, probably. <laughs> There's still time. No, we'll see what <laughs> Uh, I, have, I have one a uh, issue that I just want to uh, bring up. Um, over the years, I have been in DAC for many, many years, and I have experienced many times we bring an issue uh, that could be that should be addressed. We repeat it several times, and then it fades out. Either we forget and nothing is done about it. So I'd like to see a system develop where a valid argument is brought up to see what is being done there or they'll just say, forget it. We, don't, we cannot do it for this reason or that reason. One of the things that's very fresh in my mind is an instance I witnessed when Amherst neighborhood was holding a service um, appreciation uh, event at, um, what's that name of that park in North Amherst? Mill River. Mill River, Mill River. And the, the event was organized on a platform. And during that event, an elder member of Amherst Neighbors she couldn't see that there was a lip on the platform and she fell. And there were several people, um, including the town manager that was present there. And I brought this up in our next DAC meeting. And then the next meeting, I reminded it again 
And I don't see anything being done, followed up about it. I mean, it could be very simple that very sharp lines could be drawn or some kind of a fence system or something that could be relatively inexpensive. So the town shouldn't wait for somebody to bring a legal case against them. You know, so that is always something that always frustrates me. Like if there is a question or a suggestion, it should be followed up. Yeah. Uh, if I may, I would like to respond to that. So yeah, thank you, Saren, for bringing that up at the last meeting. Um, I have, and um, since that meeting, so someone fell off of the platform at the pavilion at the Mill River Recreation Area. Um, and so I spoke to the building commissioner and asked that he go out and take a, a look at, at, at the pavilion and he did, um, and he has a variety of issues with the pavilion, um, um, that go beyond the lip in, in that particular area that the person fell. So, um, I, I would suggest that the board, um, make a recommendation uh, to the town manager to address uh, the ADA issues at the pavilion um, and to copy the recreation department director um, and um, have these fixed and perhaps um, close off the pavilion until they are uh, corrected. Huh. That would be my recommendation. So okay. you mean the board should write? The board, you mean this DAC committee? Is that what yes. you mean? Okay. Okay, I can work with you, Myra. Okay. Um, well. But that is an item on the agenda. So we yeah. can either deal Just with that now that or, or do, it later in the meeting. Um, I guess my question is, do we have any questions or comments additionally for for Pamela Nolan Young, or can she leave? Because she sounds like she has a lot to do. <laughs> um, does anybody want to make any comments? She's a keeper. <laughs> yeah, good to me. <laughs> we'll Thank be you. happy to work with her. Yes. Whenever you need our two cents. And, Thank you. Um, and how do we, if we, um, if we ever have two cents, what's the best way for us to communicate with you? Um, email. So it's youngp at amersma.gov. Um, okay. And um, and I think I think that the DEI website has been updated, so you can find find the department on the on the town's website. Um, and you know, if you pref would prefer to leave a voice message, the telephone number's there as well. So. I, either of those will work, and I will um, I will ask uh, Maureen to share your contact information with me. I think I probably could track it down. At, um, so as we start to work on the workshops, I can reach out and sure. seek your advice and and um, and your input. So thank you very much. Thank yeah, you. thank you for coming. Thank, thank you. you for being so candid. Thank you. Thank you for being so good. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. No, this, yeah. This, this, this could be a really good, um, a really good partnership. Best well, of I, luck with all the work you have to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Well, thank you. Thank okay. You. All right. Have a great, great rest of the day. You too. Thank you you too. <laughs> okay. So um, we need to write a letter. Uh, you could just, um, Perhaps make a motion to. Okay, I can make a um, motion. To send a letter um, to recommend the town manager. Let's see. Well, let's think about it. Uh, to recommend the town manager to cor to uh, have um, all um, ADA matters uh, addressed uh, related to the pavilion and the route connecting to the pavilion corrected um, and perhaps if needed, close the pavilion until that happens. I, I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't. I mean, these are just recommendations. They will, they'll do. Um, 
I don't so know if talk, it should be closed. And but. I think we should talk also, to the building inspector, right? And he, what else did he see? Did he tell you or does, did he just say there's more than that? Uh, he said there's a variety of issues with it. So you could say, you know, per the building commissioner's um, evaluation. Uh, 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 yeah, evaluation of the pavilion. There, there are numerous ADA matters at the pavilion that need to be corrected um, and should and should be corrected by the town. Yeah. Marty, maybe someone else can um, better compose a, a motion. And but, maybe, so. maybe we should also refer to that incident that happened, which you know mm -hmm. you can't you know, refer to that I think, in a motion. You would refer to that in the letter you write. But yes, and we yes. just need a motion that tells the committee to contact the town manager and the building inspector to ask them to remedy. The ADA, the uh, the uh, violations, the ADA violations, yeah, to remedy the ADA violations at Mill River Pavilion, yeah, yeah. Every, uh, or what do they say, at and about the pavilion? Is that what they say, Marty? Yeah, just in, on in the entire site. But I would also add to it that um, they should not I'll, allow any scheduled use of the property until um, it's corrected. Because you're not gonna stop people from using it, but I would not allow people to um, schedule using the pavilion and the park area until it's corrected. Does the town have liability? Um, Absolutely. Okay, so that's- They have liability every single time somebody walks on that property. Got it, okay. So I guess what we wanna do is we need a motion that says that um, we urge the town manager to direct the um, to direct the appropriate parties to remedy the ADA violations at Mill River uh, or at or near the Mill River Pavilion, um, and that they not schedule any events until those rem and those violations are remedied. Can you do something? I second that. Maureen? Yes, that sounds good. And I, I can play with the the exact wording and, and provide a copy to everyone before it gets brought out. Um, and and then we could include um, sort of the uh, background information about the, the, the particular event that the uh, a resident unfortunately fell. Okay. So we need to, are you saying we should wait till the next meeting before we vote on this? No, I, I think, uh, uh, hmm, up to you. No, we should do it now. We should do it now. Okay. So um, I guess we need to vote on a motion that has, we don't know exactly what it says. Uh, motion to write the letter. To write the letter to um, the town manager. manager. Yep. As well as the building inspector. And I would also put the public works there. Uh yeah. it's it's I think that the Mill River Recreation area is under the mm, responsibility of the town manager's office well, and uh, the we, recreation director uh we, department. We add an extra because I'm afraid that they'll say, ah. You didn't address it to the public work, so that's sure. no good. Write another well, letter. We could know? CC. We could CC that, but the public works director, if he is told to do it by the town manager, might do it. But <laughs> it's another. However, thing he, I remember it's another thing that he might do. I remember we had a discussion before. I don't know how many months ago that. Uh, Told, I mean, the town manager told me when we both witnessed that incident that 
uh, he said, I wonder if this was in the 504 plans, transi transition plans. And I said, I have no idea. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. that I don't know. Yeah, we should, we need to look and see if they touched on Mill River. I don't know if they did. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, make a note know. to double check to see that. Is. is there any way we can uh, see that uh, five or four plan done for for Mill River recreation? Yep, area? yep. I can provide you a copy. Okay, at least I think it's an ADA plan. Yep. I don't think it's a five or four. I think it's an ADA plan. It's just a different thing. But anyway, um, okay, so we have a motion essentially that we need the town to fix this. So we need to tell the town manager that, that we urge him to take care of the ADA violations that are, you know, surrounding, that are, you know, per pertinent to the ADA, pertinent to the pavilion at Mill River. And because we can't tell him everything because then he's going to say, well, the bathhouse is inaccessible and yeah. we're not talking about that. And so, there's not the bathroom in the area and that yeah. kind of a thing. Well, yeah. but he, we can't do everything. So what we're interested yeah. in is for him to remedy the violations um, around and on or around the pavilion at uh, Mill River and that they should not schedule any events at that pavilion until they are in, they, uh, the These are in compliance with the regulations. Yes. All right. We uh, Saren seconded it. Yes. Um, who oh, do we? Is there any discussion? Nope. Okay. Want to vote? Yes. Sure. Okay, Saren. Hi. Elise? Yes. Marty? Yes. And me? Yes. Okay, so we have four of our five members present and it's unanimous. All right. Um, Maureen, do you want to talk about the FY23? Yeah, sure. So, um, what is it? The Mass Office on uh, Disabilities. They have a yearly grant cycle um, for ADA improvements um, uh, for towns and cities across Massachusetts. And so Amherst has um, submitted a grant application um, at the end of September um, for, um, what is it, is to make uh, ADA improvements to the outdoor uh, courtyard um, outside of the Bangs Community Center. So we uh, we talked about it uh, at the last meeting. Yep. Um, and so we have gone ahead and submitted that application and we should know probably by the end of December whether we're, the town has awarded that grant or not. Okay, that's great. Do we know um, what we're using, uh, what we're proposing to the Joint Capital Planning Committee for the $50,000 that they have reserved for ADA improvements. Do we did we ever? Um, do you have anything that came down the pipeline to you? Because if we didn't, we could suggest that they do that for Mill River. Yeah, yeah. I, I um, that includes. I will discuss that with staff. I, I'm I'm not um, too sure about um, about uh, if there's any particular um, projects that that um, the town uh, wishes to use for that ADA improvement capital budget item um, and um, whether the Mill River Rec Department, Rec Rec Recreation Area, um, with, with, if that would um, qualify for that. Um, I'll certainly look into it. Okay. I mean, I don't care what money they use as long as- Yeah, exactly. You know, it doesn't, you know, but sometimes we, sometimes we make suggestions, so, if you can find out, um, then we can advocate for that with a joint capital planning uh, group. Okay, so the other piece is about lights, lighting street lights in the town. Um, there, Pat, I'm hopeful that you can tell us what the proposal is that came before the 
council so that we know what we're talking about? Um, is it turning only turning lights off, changing lights? Um, and when are they going to decide? Is Pat there? Yes, I'm here. Oh, here you are. Okay. okay. You're on mute, Pat. Oh, whoop. Can you hear uh, me? Yes. yes. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I believe it's coming up on the 21st. I'll do, um, I'll I've check that out and get that information. I can send it to you uh, by email. Um, there, the proposal, as far as I remember it, uh, in some places it's to uh, turn off lighting, dim lighting, and also to angle lighting down. Um, and there are there are some of the proposal initially, and I have not seen the revised one, uh, had a certain time where some street lights would be turned off. Tracy may even have more information than I do. I'm not supporting this. I'm, you know, I'm interested in places where we might be able to angle light down, but that's that you still get a a broad spec, you know, range of light. But I think, in terms of people's ability to see at night and be seen, uh, is really critical. And I don't see from what I remember of the original proposal that that really was looked at. Um, so it is coming forward on the 21st, but I will get more information to all of you. I apologize. And I don't know if you wanna pull, if Tracy wants to raise her hand or has more information. Oh, we can uh, make our panelists talk about that. Yeah, she was, so she, she, she sent some incredible uh, uh, information to the council um, that I thought was extremely important. Uh, While we're getting her put on there, can, um, would you, consider like making a motion to the council to divide angling down from turning off? I would certainly consider that. Let me go over exactly what's being proposed and if uh, and I can do that. Because that way something could be done, but not all of it. If it's done as one thing, it's, you know, you could, you, you know, I mean, I could never vote yes. Um, but if it's done piecemeal regarding which ones they have in mind to turn to angle down or can easily angle down versus the ones they want to turn off, I think it's two issues. Right. And for me, I will add, um, um, I it mean it's a it's a it's an expense to the town to change the lighting. And I'm not sure that I, that's another aspect of it, which is of less concern in a certain kind of way, but I'm not sure I'm ready to have money used that way, given how tight our budget is. Uh, Marty has raised her hand. Yeah. Yeah. I just talking about, it's not a matter of angling the lights down. It's actually a matter of replacing the lights. And they replace them with LEDs that are very, they're right. flat, long lights that really only give down light. So it doesn't bother the um, birds flying. And it does give a much better, even light. And yes, it's expensive, but in the long run, it saves money because it's an energy saving. Yeah. And it's much better than turning off lights because our town doesn't have a lot of lights. That's right. You know, when you really look at it, the place you need lights are at intersections and in the downtown area where there's people walking. But you know, when you get outside of town, they're only at the intersections. Yeah. Marty, thank you for that information about the LEDs. Yeah, I've it's it's that. we should be changing all of our lights out to LEDs. The lights that are really the problem are the ones that are the globe lights that put a lot of light up into the sky. Yeah. And and then so what you uh and there's a term for it, um uh dark sky compliant lighting. Yes. Which yeah. is uh promoting that the light light fixtures are downcast and shielded. Yes. So they're pointing downward and they're being shielded that they're not going uh other directions other than downward. And they also reduce glare 
So when you're, you know, when you're driving at night and you've got these bright lights that you then make it impossible for you to see pedestrians. You ever, mm. you've been in that situation yep. where that happens and you can't yeah. see a pedestrian, even though there's a light right there. This happens at the university a lot. If you drive through the university, you'll find that there's spots where you can't see the pedestrian, even though it's lit. And this yeah. reduces that. Yeah. And, you know, for, for the, those that are very interested in, 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 um, seeing good examples of dark sky compliant lighting, I recommend going to the Smith College campus um, where uh, they have um, wonderful examples of what dark sky compliant lighting can look like. Yeah. Tracy has your hand up. Yeah. Are you there, Tracy? Is Tracy, wait, where's Tracy? uh to tr is tracy here what? she disappeared i think she's back in attendees i'm not oh, sure oh okay happened. let's make her one more time yeah Whoop. there she is here she comes okay sorry i was on my phone and then somehow it wouldn't let me unmute on my phone so um so um okay so with the street lights as pat said i did contact the council originally when that proposal came to the council in the summer um one thing so that the street lights proposal was proposed by councillors haneke and devlin gothier um and had a big focus on dark skies which i can appreciate but i they didn't reach out to anybody from tac or anything about some of the transportation safety implications and so when I wrote the council, I had expressed concerns just about facts like, you know, even though only say a quarter of driving is done at night, like 50% of fatalities are at night. I know for myself, you know, even though I'm not that old yet, but I still don't see that well at night sometimes driving. And that one of the things, and I did send um, information to Maureen and I know she sent it to the committee, including the links to things like, um, mm. Councillor Haneke's map of where the streetlights wouldn't no longer be and things. And one of the things is that there were a number of neighborhoods that do not have that much street lighting right now, including, say, um, like Orchard Valley and Echo Hill and Amherst Woods and things where the majority of the lights there, the streetlights are at intersections, like within the neighborhood. Um, and, yeah. and and it, at the end of cul-de-sacs some cul-de-sacs yeah. and her proposal would have turned off all of those street lights um mm -hmm. and i'm somebody who walks a lot at night and i live pretty close to downtown i live on blue hills road and it is dark even in the center of town a lot i mean i ended up walking and i i was at another meeting recently and people were talking about how you end up walking in the street because the sidewalks you know are not always in great condition sometimes there's not great lighting on the sidewalks you know there's either not that many lights or there's a lot of trees blocking the lights and so on and so really the safest place to walk is in the middle of is in the street if particularly like if the streets aren't that busy um i'm a little surprised that it's coming back to the council uh you know maybe i had heard something that maybe um the proponents of the proposal were perhaps going to suggest that it be put on hold it was referred to TSO at that initial council meeting and TSO to my knowledge has not taken it up yet at all. Um, the TSO has a very long agenda right now. I've talked about it. It's on the list, but I don't believe they've had any discussions about it because I've, I've been watching for those just in case they have them. Thank you. Um, and so my recollection of the council discussion was that it, the question was split a little bit between um, between redesigning current lights, you know, so that they have less um, glare, they have less impact on nearby homes um, and things. And then also the larger question about where street lights go. But on the first issue, one thing I've noticed is that as Eversource has put in some of the new big light poles, mm -hmm. is that they've also, when, when that's happened, the street lights that are on those poles on the old poles have been moved over to the new poles in a lot of cases and been raised like farther away from the street. So as whereas, because those new poles are so much taller that like, whereas maybe the street light used to be at say like, 
you know, one and a half stories. It's now at like two stories. And so people who never had any experience with the glare before from streetlights are feeling like it's going like right into their windows. And um, that's been the case in some of my, some of the neighborhoods I walk in a lot. Um, but so, I mean, there were a lot of questions. It seemed that the council, you know, there were concerns about, you know, particularly about where streetlights should be, where they shouldn't be, and so on, how many you should have or turn off, and accessibility and things. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, the two questions are so, but I don't believe that the TAC has looked at, I mean, that the TSO has looked at either of them at this point yet. And that's why I'm saying I'll check and thank you for that, Tracy. Yeah. And I will get back to the committee with uh, an update that's more specific. So um, I thought Mandy Joe yesterday in the meeting had said something about it coming up on the 21st. Oh, okay. I could be wrong. Yeah. I mean, I know that the um, TSO is meeting uh, on this Thursday. Um, and so it's possible it's on their agenda, but I hadn't seen it there yet. So, but thank you. Huh. Okay. So does this committee have any preliminary things that we want to have communicated to the town council um i raised my hand but yep. i know you can't see myra um this was brought the lights in amherst woods was brought up by a web group we have and people were objecting to these lights and they should they said that they shouldn't be there and um, because the glare was keeping them awake at night and it, it really was not needed. And I raised my concern. I said, listen, I'm a person with a disability living on a cul-de-sac and I have PCS coming at night to help me out. And, or sometimes I have guests coming and I really, don't have any problem with those lights and people can get drapes that will block the shine into their bedrooms if they so desire. And um, they're also in Amherst Woods, there are lots of bear sightings. And I said, it really provides some protection for the safety of people, these lights. So I have a feeling maybe they were also involved with this proposal that was brought up to the town council. Oh, they were, because that's Mandy Jo. She lives yeah. in North Woods. I mean, yeah. so one thing I was interested in, um, so James Lowenthal, who used to live in Amherst, and he now lives in Northampton. He's a Smith College professor who focuses on astronomy. Um, but he is one of the leaders of like a national dark skies group. <laughs> And he was very involved with some of the streetlight policy changes that happened in Northampton. Um, and he and he was in touch with me and advocating for why it's better to have like most of the lights turned off. Um, but in addition, I was curious and I haven't followed up with him yet, um, but I kept kind of waiting to see when this was going to be on the Amherst agenda. And then I was going to mm -hmm. go ahead and do that work. But um, I was curious just about how it works in Northampton, because on the Northampton website, there are forums that residents can click on where it can say, you can request that a light be removed, you can request a light be added, you can request a light be shielded, oh. and so on. And so one of the things I took away from the council meeting is that, you know, when Mandy Jo Henneke, who has a large streetlight outside of her house, it's been problematic for her and her family and you know when other people have complained and asked if there's anything that can be done with those lights and i am sure that people are going to be doing that more so now with some of these eversource lights um that they've been told by the town staff who went out to evaluate the situation and not who that who that is um that there was really nothing that could be done to shield the lights or anything so I've mm -hmm. just been curious about how it works in Northampton and if they're using different lighting technology. And I'm not an expert in any of that. I'm sure James Lowenthal knows way more than me. Um, so I wanted to reach out to him to see what they do and why why are Northampton streetlights able to be retrofitted when the Amherst ones can't be. Right. I but mean, the thing is, you know, we have to realize that this is a safety issue, especially okay. for people with disabilities. You know, why do we have lights in our homes? Because we're not like cats and dogs who can see at night. 
with our, without any lights. So we really need for protection and our safety. So if those are removed, you know, like if we were to take our dogs out for a walk or walk into our gardens to the street level or something, it just is not safe. So I think we should, we really should stand firmly against doing this. But if there's other LED lights, which will uh, be easier on people, it won't uh, shine upwards, it will just show down. So that is just as safe. Yeah, I, I would like to add that, you know, so I, I briefly just mentioned about um, basic concepts of dark sky compliant lights, which is having the light fixture um, pointed downward and that it's shielded. There's other factors to be considered, um, such as the intensity of that light source, um, and then also the height of that like light fixture um, needs to be considered in, in figuring out what what is the appropriate light height and the intensity of that light bulb, um, be it for a pedestrian walkway or uh, or for a road, figuring out what is the purpose of that light. So. Um, it, I'm curious to uh, to learn what, what are the specifics of of the person that has um, issues with with their street light, um, and wonder if the height of that light and the intensity of the light bulb could be adjusted. Seems to me like the t the town council really can't take a responsible vote on the twenty first. There's way too much information that we don't know yeah yeah um, and that, that i may be wrong about the date but because i may have yeah you know miss a well, maybe that's about gonna something else that. but we have been talking about it so one thing that's different about northampton is that they don't have eversource they have um the other one which we call it um natural grid yeah interesting but, you know, another difference in Northampton and also James Lowenthal has also advised Pelham in some rural communities is even Northampton does not have the large percentage of residents who do not have cars that we have in Amherst. We have a very large like transit dependent, walking dependent, walking for transportation population that these other towns don't have. And so for him, you know, when he's writing me and he's saying, well, I advise Pelham and things like, I just don't think that Pelham and Amherst are comparable. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I had like, I mean, I had particularly concerns like in some of the neighborhoods where I know that there's a lot of um, dependency on walking and things. And one thing that the research um, shows, you know, with transportation is that drivers often overestimate their ability to see pedestrians and bicyclists and things at night. And the pedestrians often overestimate how visible they are. Mm. And as a driver, I mean, I've had a number of times where I'm driving along a road and all of a sudden there's a pedestrian on the side of the street or there's a bicyclist that I did not see until I'm very close to them because they are not lit at night and they may be wearing dark clothing. Um, there is a law, I mean, James Lowenthal said, well, there's a law that bicyclists have to have lights when they bike at night, but many bikes, my, many bicyclists don't have that. And the Valley That's Bike right. Program, the lights are not very bright. Mm -hmm. And so, nope. I mean, so it's just a, you know, it's a visibility issue. I mean, people mm -hmm. can't see as far at night and all kinds of things. So um, both to be see and be seen, as people here have said, mm -hmm. it's essential mm -hmm. to have some lights. So. so Pat, what do you, what do you need from this committee? to i don't think we need to write a letter i mean we're not ready to do that but i think what do you need to have that you can tell uh the town council that there's a lot of concern about pedestrian safety uh from vehicles from animals from whatever and that um we don't have any objection with to to creating appropriate lighting, but we do have an objection to turning off a lot of what we have. That's right. That's right. I can share that during uh, committee reports, liaison reports. Okay. Uh, at the next meeting, which is the seventh, uh, the fourteenth. I'm sorry, we added an extra meeting 
Um, and I will clarify, well, you'll know by, you know, the end of the day today, whether I'm wrong about the 21st. Okay. And it sounds like I am. So that's probably just going to. Well, I mean, I hope you are that, you know. I do too. You know, I mean, there are procedural things that allow things to get right. done when they're not ready to get right. done. And, you know, all of those games. So, right. But I will share your concerns during my liaison report. Okay. Right. At the moment, I think that's really all we can do. I. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how other people feel, but I would agree with what Marty said, that if it can be done, it should be done, but they shouldn't be turned off. Yeah. They should be changed out. Agreed. Totally. Yeah. Also say one other thing. If the issue is that the power company is providing these lights, you can negotiate with the power company right. which lights they provide. Because yes. they're only going to provide the cheapest ones. Mm -hmm. So I know that UMass does negotiate with the power company about what lights they put on campus. So the town can be pro more proactive about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and one thing a neighbor told me is that um, so when Eversource switched, you know, put in the new pole, the street light had been taken off the old pole, but was sitting on the ground, like next to the poles for a while. And they had called DPW a number of times about it. And DPW family came and that they installed the new, the pole, the light on the new pole. So they were the ones, it was not Eversource. It was actually DPW who was doing the installing. And they're the ones who put the light farther from the ground. But I don't, I don't know any of the details of like who is responsible for it, who isn't. I guess that's really how that is set. I mean, these are all kind of in the details, and so right, right. it mm. is complicated business. But um, it would be yeah. great to find out a little more. So who makes the decisions? Who d negotiates with the power company? What options are there? But in the end, we don't. We want them to work it out yes, so that the lights are changed out. And not, not turn turned off. off. Yeah. No well, way. And, and one thing I had asked too, yeah. when Mandy, when the streetlights policy was being rewritten. So the current streetlights policy, which is actually over twenty years old, at this point. I mean, so one thing is in terms of that technology, like Maureen was just talking about the tech is I'd be hesitant to put a lot of tech details in a policy if it's gonna if we're only gonna that's update true. it every couple of decades. But um, two is that the current policy that's on the books for Amherst, it says that they, I forget exactly what the language is, but it's something about how we do not like provide, you know, nighttime lighting in residential neighborhoods, or we do not provide nighttime lighting for pedestrian purposes or things like that, mm -hmm. which, you know, when I looked at best practices in terms of other towns policies, like, I think I don't necessarily agree with that as a goal or as a statement that yeah. we want to have in our streetlights policy. If Amherst wants to be age friendly, dementia friendly, if we want to encourage walking and access and equity, like I think that maybe that language should be revisited. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I was disappointed to see it there in the first place. Okay. So our time is pretty much up. Maureen, uh, before we dismiss the meeting, I have one other question. Uh, what is the membership sit situation? Yeah, we sort of brought it up at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, um, uh, what is it? I I, I can again uh, ask the town manager's office to give give an update and to okay. to move forward with filling the two vacant seats. Um, it's it's. That's that's all I can do. It's it's not my role to fill those uh, vacancies. It's, it's... We've, you know, we've asked before. We've written to the manager. It's getting a little frustrating. I put it yeah. in my evaluation that I sent to Lynn Griesemer about the manager. I said that he, you know, that he uh, that he just hasn't appointed. Yeah, there may manager. not be people who have applied. Well, let me tell you something about that. The executive director, I mean, uh, the retired executive director of Stavros, who's very knowledgeable on ADA and rights of people with disabilities after working there for 30 some years, he submitted an application and the town manager is aware of that. 
he told me personally that he, Jim Crenier is his name, he gave me as reference. And I said, all I can say is go for it. Because not only his experience himself, his late wife was a person with a disability. Wow. So this was like two months ago at that Mill River uh, event I was at. Yeah, and there some... was, Pat, there was a woman who applied the last time we filled a vacancy who seemed like she would be very good and she wasn't chosen. But it was, it's, we've been, we've had an opening for 15 months. Yeah. Yeah, and that person could have been tapped pretty easily at that point. It hadn't been that long. I don't know if she's interested or if she's moved on. I don't know. But um, I, I feel like this has not been handled expeditiously at all. So perhaps Pat could yeah. mention yeah. it. Bring at a meeting. that up. Yeah. yeah uh, so uh, we have uh, two raised hands and then we, we okay, need then to we're done. Right. Then we okay. have to go. Marty. Um, yeah, I just wanted to bring up, have we had any report back from the D DPW about the non-functioning um, no. in the intersection lights no. and audible signals? Because they just rebuilt the one at um, South Pleasant and East Hadley. And I don't, I have not tried it, but I'd like to know if it works. Uh, say they the just street. rebuilt that intersection. Uh, say the intersection one more time. East, uh, South Pleasant Street and East Hadley. Okay. They just rebuilt it, put in new curb cuts. I've been watching them do it for the last couple of months. Hmm. And if okay. they didn't fix those crosswalk uh, signals, I would be really disappointed. I, I'll, have, I'll look into they it. Have made uh, some there is a little bit of audibility on the uh, Triangle Street one, but on uh, Main Street. It's not loud enough. Marty, could you send me any of the streets that you're concerned with? Because I've brought that up even directly to Guilford Mooring, and he keeps saying, oh, they work, they work. No. They oh, no, I have a spreadsheet. I Would did you a spreadsheet. Send, resend and that we, to me? And I'll we found send out it. from Tracy yeah. a couple of weeks a couple of meetings ago that no. this has been a long-standing project and that they've they've done that survey that i did a couple of years ago They're terrible. and nothing's been done marty did They're it terrible. marty did it in july of 21 yes marty well, and went one saturday and took notes and made a spreadsheet which we well, immediately sent to the manager and to guilford and they have done something um, I don't know if what they've done, you know, it would be nice if, if he said, I'm working on this one. Can you let me know if it if it's audible? Can you let me know if blah, blah, blah? I mean, but we've heard nothing. He communicates no. nothing at all. Well, Marty, yeah, if you could enough. resend to me and then Tracy, maybe I, you and I can talk also after um, I'll, I'll set up a time with you via email sure. that maybe we can get together. So you can we can get this going again. Okay. Uh, Marty, can yeah. you resend it or I can I can find it, Marty. You want to send it, Marty? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, and I will just say that yeah. um, the planning department did uh, request and receive uh, funds to um, uh, assess the um, the audible signals. Have a expert come in and oh. and evaluate it and right. to fix it. Um, so when was uh, that? Th well, that that was approved for this fiscal year. Okay. So, um, well, so that that's another step forward. Yeah. This fiscal year is in its fifth month, and the winter months aren't all that great for making repairs. Yeah. So this fiscal year is for all intents and purposes, more than a third over. Yeah. And we want to know what they did. And yep. I mean, we 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 need to have information sent to us about what they yes. did. Yes. Okay, what was the who had the other hand up? Elise. I did. I just I have to go now though. It's one and yep. I have an appointment. All so right, it folks. wasn't that important. So, you know, basically what I was just saying is um the light thing is also a safety thing. I don't want some creep following me home um, in the dark on North Pleasant Street. So that's just my two cents. 
Thank so you. I, I don't want them turned off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So the next meeting. Right. No, thank you, Elise, for go. saying that. Uh, the next meeting is Tuesday, December the 13th. And I think all I just right. sent um, everyone a, a meeting invite. Um, so yeah. 13th, right. and we're going yeah. to have the, right. somebody from the relay system come and talk to us about yes. this. Yeah. And maybe we could talk about sidewalks and snow. I've been talking yes. to Walk Boston. So we're mm -hmm. trying to we're okay. trying to make some progress. Okay. Tracy, right. thank you. Thanks. Adjourn. Right. Great. Okay. Next year. Thanks.